Welcome everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Jackie Gahagan. I'm Associate Vice President of Research at Mount St. Vincent University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which is called Finding Our History, a conversation about LGBT collections and exhibitions. As you all know, October is LGBT History Month, and we're really pleased to be able to offer this webinar in celebration of the lives and contributions of our communities. This webinar is meant to share information about how we're building and how we continue to build awareness about our rich histories within the LGBTQ communities across Atlantic Canada. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University, the host of this event, is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and they were all treaty people. For those of you who may be less familiar with Microsoft Teams, you can ask questions in the chat box and we'll, we'll save these for the Q&A session after the speaker's presentations. Please note that the session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive website after the event. Today, we're so very fortunate to be hearing from a variety of speakers about the great work that they are doing to help preserve the histories of our LGBT communities. I would kindly ask that um, uh, each speaker keep their presentation to the 10 minute mark so that we can have time for the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Meredith J. Batt, uh, who is an archivist with the Provincial Archives in New Brunswick and the president of the Queer Heritage Initiative of New Brunswick, an archival initiative which collects the history of 2S LGBTQI plus people from across the province. Their forthcoming book uh, called Len and Cub, a queer history explores one of the oldest known photographic records of a same-sex couple in the Maritimes, which was released in April 2022, will be released in April 2022 uh, by Goose Lane's Editions. Uh, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Meredith. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Meredith Batt, uh, like Jackie said, and today I'm presenting as the president of the Queer Heritage Initiative of New Brunswick. Um, I'm speaking to you here in Fredericton on the um, unceded, unsurrendered uh, territories of the Willistigwaic and Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, I'm so happy to be able to present today too um, and pleased to announce the release of our finding aids um, for the for the Queer Heritage Initiative of New Brunswick. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, QHINB was established in 2016 by Dusty Green, who was an archival summer student here at uh, the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick, um, where our records are held. Um, and Dusty um, wanted to find out a little bit more about the queer history of the province and uh, the LGBTQ uh, people who came before him. Um, and so uh, our aim is to collect the queer history of the province of New Brunswick through dark documents, artifacts, oral histories, and provide public education sessions to give people an opportunity to learn the stories of LGBTQ plus peoples. Um, our records are available 9 to 5, um, Monday to Friday, uh, here at the uh, Provincial Archives of New Brunswick. Um, and so they can be uh, they can be consulted at any time. Um, however, one problem has been, um, you know, making our finding aids accessible for people to find out what material we have. Um, uh, all the finding aids here at the provincial archives are not online yet. Um, so we've partnered up with our council, the Council of Archives, New Brunswick, um, to make our finding aids available. Um, Currently, we have over 14 collections um, whose, finding, whose finding aids are online. Um, so we have a variety of material from across the province relating to groups and individuals. Um, and I will uh, be showing you the database today. Uh, 
This is just a sampling of some of the materials that we have. Um, it's a wide variety. It spans from the 1970s up until almost present day. Um, and like I said, uh, we have material from various regions across the province. So with our um, we, so with our, our partner, uh, the Council of Archives, New Brunswick, special thanks to um, former executive director Kim McGuire and um, her summer students. We were able to um, upload uh, a lot of the, the finding aids um, to uh, canbarchives.ca. Um, so if you type that into a Google search, um, you'd be able to find it. Or you can also search for the Queer Heritage Initiative in Google and it, it comes up. Um, and I should just add before I switch slides and show you how the database works, um, that I can be contacted either by Facebook or by email um, if you have any questions or, or if you are interested in um, pursuing uh, various research topics or you want more information, um, you can reach out to, um, to myself uh, through New Brunswick QI at gmail.com, all lowercase. Um, so when you make your way to the home page of the CANB archives, you'll click on database, visit the database here, and then you are taken to their database website. You can type in Rare Heritage Initiative. I see it's already coming up, so I'm just going to do a search. Oh. Queer Heritage Initiative. And it takes you to the page. Um, on the side here, you can browse the 14 holdings. Um, we also have contact information too. So um, if you are looking to contact us, you can um, use the email there. Or there's also, um, we have a web website with another partnering organization through a UNB Teachers Project too, where you can find out a little bit more about the work that we've been doing. Um, so you are, are able to search through these um, these holdings. Um, a lot of them have the paper finding aid attached as well. So for example, um, if you were interested in um, the Moncton River of Pride collection, um, you can see a little bit more about um, the, the records that we have here, including the uploaded finding aid. Um, and uh, just a little bit more about the the images and the clippings that we have. Um, and we have uh, four binders of material that had been donated. It was a loan to copy. And you can see the various items that we have too. Um, so we don't have the images linked as of yet. Um, and we, we may not for some time to come, um, but this gives um, folks an idea of the types of material that we have. You can also search, um, so like let's say you were interested in um, lesbian history or lesbian activism, you can do a search um, for and you will find right now it's saying that we've got 32 hits with lesbian in the title. And we have um, a number of different uh, posters I'm seeing, et cetera. And you can uh, also do an advanced search too. Um, so I'm right now I'm going to turn things back over to uh, Jackie. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to participate. And uh, happy, happy uh, Queer History Month. Great, thank you very much, Meredith, for that wonderful presentation. Um, our next presenter is Rachel Moore, who is a queer archivist residing in Halifax. Through her work as a research assistant with the Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive, Rachel is involved in processing and preservation of Nova Scotia's LGBT history. She's passionate about protecting this cultural history and providing access for future generations. Rachel received her Master's of Library and Information Studies this past May from the Dalhousie University School of Information Management. During her time at SIM, Rachel served as programming co-chair and later conference co-chair for Information Without Borders Conference, where she oversaw the conference 
conference's uh, transition to an online format. She was awarded the 2021 SIM Leadership Award in recognition of this work. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so as Jackie said, my name is Rachel Moore and I'm a research assistant with the Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive. Um, we are a part of the Dalhousie University Archives and we operate out of the Killam Library here in Halifax. Just having some issues with my slides, just bear with me one moment here. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so a little bit about us. Our archive was founded by our moderator today, Jackie Gahagan, in 2019 with original funding from the Nova Scotia Department of Seniors. As such, we are an intergenerational project whose mission is to collect, arrange, preserve and make accessible records of the contributions made by LGBT seniors in the province of Nova Scotia. So this archive is meant to support teaching and research related to LGBT seniors both at Dalhousie as well as within the broader community in Nova Scotia and beyond. Today I'm going to talk about some of the ways we've tried to tailor our approach to better serve the community beginning with our community consultation process. So when working with records that document marginalized communities, it's very important to approach the archival process conscientiously. Historically, institutions have not always been respectful of the wishes of marginalized communities and their approach to description, leading to a sense of mistrust. So it is scary to think that the materials you've spent your whole life collecting and preserving could be given to an archive that doesn't make an adequate effort to understand or accurately represent the identities and experiences contained therein. And to ensure we handle these materials respectfully and accurately, we've committed to maintaining an open dialogue with members of the LGBT community. We hold monthly meetings of our community advisory committee where we invite members of the community to give input on everything from how we describe materials to our donation guidelines and mission statement. Many of our community advisory committee members have been embedded in Nova Scotia's LGBT community for decades and are therefore able to provide essential context to the donated materials to help researchers better understand these materials and the individuals that they represent. Uh, they also help us craft guiding documents that contain accessible language to help demystify the archival process and solidify our commitments to the community. All in all, the committee is our way of collaborating with the community to ensure that their ideas are heard. So based on consultation with the CAC, we've developed a handful of projects to expand our holdings so that they better represent the full scope of the LGBT community here in the province. And one of these projects is our Lesbian Oral Histories Project. While we've been lucky enough to collect a significant body of records that document the lives of gay men, we have not been as successful in collecting materials related to queer women or gender diverse people. And this comparative lack of materials is likely due in part to the fact that organized activism in the province has lacked a focus on what we would consider women's issues. And many of the prominent legal challenges, such as the push for marriage equality, have had mostly male litigants. Um, so these sorts of organized efforts produce a lot of paper records, whereas everyday experiences like coming out or forming relationships don't tend to generate a lot of physical records. So there's a lot of history that unfortunately goes undocumented. So to address this gap, we applied for funding from the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage's Strategic Development Initiative to conduct oral history interviews to supplement our collection. With this funding, we are now processing or we are now in the process of interviewing seniors who identify as lesbian, as well as other queer women and gender diverse people. These interviews are loosely structured using broad questions as a starting point to allow participants to discuss whatever is most important to them. Through this process, we hope to collect stories that represent some of the less tangible aspects of the LGBT experience here in Nova Scotia. Transcripts and recordings from this project will be available as born digital objects within the archives catalog within the next few months, so stay tuned as the project progresses. Another project we've been working on based on feedback from the Community Advisory Committee is the creation of our duplicates collection. One of the excellent things about our donors is that they've been fantastic at holding on to valuable records. So this means that in some cases we have multiple duplicate copies of certain records. 
due to the cultural significance of these materials, we wanted to figure out a way to, to use them that directly benefits the community rather than discarding them or returning them to the donor. One of the limitations of traditional archival records is that for the most part, they have to be accessed within the archive space and cannot be altered. So while this is necessary from a preservation perspective, it does limit how members of the community can interact with these materials. Through consultation with our CAC, we've, uh, the community has expressed a need for col a collection of records that can be borrowed for use outside of the archives. As a result, we've created the LGBT duplicate materials collection, which will go live when the catalog updates in early November, so probably next week. Uh, materials in this collection can be borrowed for a wide range of educational, artistic, outreach, and display purposes, including art projects, activism, cultural exhibits, and more. Certain materials can even be altered or borrowed without the expectation that they be returned, so there's lots of possibilities. And I'm happy to uh, discuss this more during the question period if anyone wants to hear more about the duplicate materials collection or the uh, Lesbian Oral Histories project. Um, for the sake of time, I will leave it there and pass it back to Jackie. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very interesting presentation, Rachel. And I'm just going to check to see if Denise has been able to join us. Denise, if you're there, could you unmute yourself and just let us know that you are on the call? Okay, I will take it that Denise has had some technical issues connecting. So uh, we will pass it along now to Robin Metcalf. Robin Metcalf is a Canadian writer, critic, and curator. Uh, he has been active nationally and internationally as a gay activist, journalist, and community historian since the mid-1970s. His fiction, poetry, and essays have appeared in more than 60 magazines, including The Body Politic and many other anthologies. His exhibitions include Queer Looking, Queer Acting, Lesbian and Gay Vernacular, MSVU Art Gallery 1997, uh, Camp, Fires, uh, Garnier Museum 2014, touring in Montreal, Halifax, and Washington. He won the 2000 Evelyn Richardson Prize for Nonfiction and was shortlisted for a Canadian National Magazine Award in 2004. Halifax Pride named him Honorary Grand Marshal in 2010. Over to you, please, Robin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jackie. Uh, Gwe, bonjour. Hello, everyone. Um, the Passage Memory Project is a place. It's in Weijuik, Eski Gewigik District, Mi'kma'ki, which is unceded Mi'kmaq territory, and whatever the government of New Brunswick uh, thinks at the moment, it is still unceded, uh, and covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship from 1725 on. It's also the homeland of my own Acadian ancestors, and is in Sheet Harbor Passage, Halifax Regional Municipality, a little less than two hours from downtown Chibuktuk, or Halifax. The Passage Memory Project is a place to live. It is my home. It is a place to garden, to learn what the land has to teach us, to practice ecological decolonization, to support the restoration of native ecosystems. The Passage Memory Project is a place to read, a library, a place to write. The Passage Memory Project is an archive. It's an archive of nearly half a century of my own involvements and those of my colleagues and my communities. This is my activism as an activist in queer and social justice movements, as a queer journalist, as a writer of poetry, erotic fiction and essays, as a curator of contemporary art and craft, and as a public art gallery director. In 1997, I organized an exhibition at Mount St. Vincent University Art Gallery called Queer Looking, Queer Lack, queer acting, lesbian and gay vernacular. The objects in the exhibition, many of which were drawn from my own collection, represented the kinds of visual materials that the local queer community had produced between 1972 and 1997 as part of the activist project of gay and lesbian liberation. A 120 page catalog accompanied the exhibition. In 2014, the Kyber Center for the Arts, a Halifax artist-run center that has recently been in the forefront of engaging with queer, trans, and BIPOC communities, published a second edition with an additional 24 pages on queer activist culture from more recent years. The Passage Memory Project is a meeting place, a place to chat, 
a place to cook and eat together, a place to spend the night. Let's linger for a moment on this image of the guest room at the passage. On the bed, you will see the two teddy bears, Ted and Fred. Ted and Fred are the creations of Fredericton artist Anthony Wallace. In 1981, he created the comic strip Furry Frolics. It tells the story of how Ted and Fred met and how their relationship developed. That comic strip first appeared in the periodical Making Waves, an Atlantic quarterly for lesbians and gay men, which I published working with an editorial collective of two women and two men, Pat Dingle, Ann Fulton, James McSwain, and myself. In, in the guest room closet and in the neighboring rooms, you can find the complete archives of Making Waves, including the original artwork for episode four of Furry Follicks, which never made it to press when the quarterly stopped publishing in 1982. You can also find on the top shelf uh, a complete run of The Body Politic, the gay liberation journal that the radical collective Pink Triangle Press published out of Toronto from 1972 to 1987, for which I wrote as the Halifax correspondent for 10 years and which gave rise to the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives, now known as the Archives. Uh, on the front page of this issue, in the middle, you'll see a placard for Chan, St. John's, Newfoundland. I'm the person holding that placard. In the guest room at the passage, you can share a bed with Ted and Fred. You can sleep beneath their official portrait painted by Halifax artist Mitchell Weed. You can share with them a pillow created by the queer indigenous artist Kent Monkman. The Passage Memory Project is an archive you can sleep with. What could be queerer than that? I am working with colleagues and members of diverse communities to develop the concept of the Passage Memory Project. NASCAD undergraduate student Brody Weaver, she, they, is currently engaged in both an internship and an independent study in association with the Passage Memory Project, as part of which we are mapping its conceptual framework. The Passage Memory Project resists and ruptures the taxonomic boundaries of the archive, the art gallery, the library, the museum. It incorporates a profusion of objects, artworks, and documents that range from print documents, through posters, buttons, t-shirts, matchbooks, photographs, phonographic records, and ephemera, such as this pink triangle cookie from the book launch for Rebecca Rose's history of the Halifax queer community before the parade. This is a photo of me and Rebecca when we shared the keynote presentation at the 2015 Gala of Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project. The book I'm holding is Out, the second edition of Queer Looking, Queer Acting. That publication was the most extensive social history of Halifax queer activism in print until Rebecca's book in 2020, before the parade, pardon me. In preparing her book, Rebecca spent an intensive research weekend at The Passage. So did Craig Janix when he was working with Nisha Aswaran on their book for the Archives, Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. This is Craig at the passage with Kane, my partner Wesley's little dog. That's the end of my slideshow. I'm just going to get out of this now and um, go back to uh, make myself here. Um, uh, so you should be able to see me now. And um, I would just uh, finish up by saying that the Passage Memory Project is a counter archive. The website of the Archives Counter Archive Project at York University defines counter archives as, quote, political, ingenious, resistant, and community based. They are embodied differently and have explicit intention to historicize differently, to disrupt conventional national narratives and to write difference into public accounts. They seek to counter the hegemony of traditional archival institutions that have normally neglected or marginalized women, indigenous, Inuit, and Métis peoples, the LGBTQ plus community and immigrant communities." End quote. The Passage Memory Project seeks to embody a responsive and ever-changing space, um, queer space, of meeting, of sharing, of storytelling, of memory keeping, of conversation, of reflection, of eating and laughing and talking together. 
If the mem passage memory project interests you, then please be my guest. Walaliok, merci beaucoup. Thank you all. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you very much, Robin. That was a very uh, interesting presentation on the Passage Memory Project, and we're grateful to have you here with us today. Um, our next speaker is Denise Rodriguez, who practices uh, librarianship at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Among her responsibilities are coordinating e-learning and library research services, liaison with departments in social sciences, including women's studies, and teaching a credit-bearing online information literacy course. Denise is keenly interested in using digital media and popular culture to open up dialogues and to keep students engaged with research. Over to you, Denise. Hello, thank you, Jackie. So um, today I'm speaking not about, you know, finding our history, not so much about local history, but rather about artifacts, in this case, books from the mid 20th century, mainly the Lesbian Pulp Fiction Collection at uh, Mao St. Vincent University. So just a little background, the lesbian pulp fiction were a genre of pulp fiction that was published uh, in the 50s and mid 60s, 1960s that is. And you can see from the, the image that the lesbian uh, content was quite clearly depicted on the, the covers. So why this is important, why we see this as a, a, a part of the history is not, they weren't just poorly written sort of pulpy uh, novels with lurid covers. They actually were one of the few forms of white bisexual and lesbian representation in popular culture in the 1950s and 1960s. For better, because they gave some sort of recognition to the community, and for worse, because a lot of the books were quite exploitative. Uh, but even the exploitative books helped to redefine obscenity laws in North America, so they, they still do have value for that. And the, the positive, more, more positive, I should say, books at least help plant some of the seeds of early lesbian identity. So this is a little bit what the uh, the collection looks like at the Mount. And one of the challenges was how do we connect the books with some of those themes that I talked about? How do we actually find out which books were written by queer women? Which books, you know, have happy endings? Which books, you know, are sort of examples of the bury your gays or dead lesbians trope? Like if you're looking for one of those themes, how do you know which book to get? And from that was born this online exhibit that we have and that we invite you to explore. Uh, for the digital humanities nudes out there, it's built on uh, Omika. And the intent was to sort of be used as a finding tool. So there's a little exhibit, so you can click up at the top on what is lesbian fiction, contested books and some other themes. And we have a little introductory uh, video that uh, will give some context. And then on each of the pages that sort of explain the context, we also uh, provide uh, links where you can actually uh, click through to see which books then connect with those themes or that context once you click through to see what an, an actual book is. Of course, we've got the bibliographic information, much like you would find in a library catalog. But added to that, we've started to add themes and subject information. Uh, some of these will be spoiler alerts for the casual reader. We are starting to to look at okay what's the status at the end does the lesbian relationship actually survive the the story or is it one of those ones with the 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 sad ending um, where did they meet uh, that sort of thing because for researchers that will be of interest to be able to to know which themes are being picked up? Where did they meet? Is it a book with a like the bar scenes? Is it a book that's set in a dormitory? 
Additionally, we're starting to collect the extra textual information. So reviews of the time, there was a lesbian newsletter called The Ladder in the 1950s, 1960s, and there were some reviews of these books in them, not all obviously, but we've gotten permission um, to be able to add these here. There was also a sort of a boycott group, a religious based group that was trying to boycott these things, and they also had their little reports um, warning about the books. We've also added those here uh, again as evidence of some of the boycott and censorship that was happening at the time with these books. and. We've uh, added those the records as well. Um, we're also sort of uh, tagging the cover art, so which is almost separate from the uh, the stories that are written. The the art isn't is a uh, item in itself, so that if you want to see all the items with single women, you can just click on single woman and you again get that list to browse or the fashion items, the tone, the background. Again, allowing people to be able to find books that are common in their theme. At the bottom of the page, we are open to comments, and although it, we don't have a lot of comments, those that we received have been great. They're asking, you know, for information about, you know, how we know what we know about the authors, especially since so many of them are pseudonyms. Others have actually helped us correct information on that, so we, we're really valuing the uh, response we're getting from the wider community um, based on those comments. So just want to close by saying we also hope that you use this online exhibit to actually come and connect with the books. They're right in our uh, sort of very public area next to our main library desk to help protect them. They're for in library use only, but we welcome members of the public to come and take a look at them. And uh, back to you, Jackie. Thank you very much, Denise, for that really interesting presentation on uh, lesbian pulp fiction. And I, I love the fact that the uh, collection is right beside the circulation desk, so there's no getting around it. That's fabulous. Um, so our next uh, presenter is J Daisy Jeffries, who is a sixth generation white settler, artist, writer and researcher born and raised in the Bay of Exploits in the northeast coast of rural Newfoundland, deeply informed by geographies and histories of trans women and sex workers in Atlantic Canada. Her research creation and multidisciplinary projects have been exhibited at Eastern Edge, The Rooms, Unscripted, Twilling Gate, Inverness County Centre for the Arts, and Cape Breton University Art Gallery, as well as performed widely at festivals, theatres, house shows in St. John's, including Hold Fast, Lana Wino Fem Fest, uh, and Out of Earshot, co-author of Autoethnography and Feminist Theory at the Water's Edge, Unsettled Islands 2018. She has recent publications in Riddle, Fence, Understory, Held, The Dalhousie Review, Arc, and Feral Feminisms. Um, welcome, Daisy, and over to you. Hi, everyone. I just want to make sure that you can see my slides here. Okay, cool. So I'm joining today from um, the ancestral territory of the Biotech in the Bay of Exploits. Um, cold weather here today, overcast, foggy. Thinking about these questions as always in my practice, what is held by archives? What is known and unknown? What do the land and water remember? And so I think of these three questions together as forming a counter archival practice in my research and creation that began um, as a graduate student, as a sex working trans woman graduate student um, in 2018 and 2019. So I did a bunch of archival research at that period of time at the Center for Newfoundland Studies, um, asking questions about belonging and community and intergenerational knowledge exchanges. And so at the Center for Newfoundland Studies, um, they have 
vertical files, they have a homosexuals vertical file, an LGB vertical file, a prostitution vertical file. Um, and outside of those, it's hard to locate uh, queer documents or materials. And so there is the necessitation of further outreach and community engagement um, to think beyond some of these documents. These first two um, fragments are from Chan's About Face newsletter published in the early 1970s. And it's funny, Robin, that you give the history of holding the placard in that photo. On my last slide in this presentation, I have a much lower resolution snapshot of that, but I didn't know that it came from the body politic. At the Center for Flan Studies, again, um, negotiating through um, what remains, what has been collected, what has been documented, wondering about specific disconnections um, doing this kind of historical research in rural places, uh, questioning how queer and trans rural histories are documented, if ever, but also looking um, otherwise. And so within these few documents, we see a certain kind of representation of, of queer and trans life. Um, there's violence, there is also a lot of new beginnings. And we see these groups like GELT, um, who you know organized the About Face newsletter or organizations like NGIL undertaking their own historical projects to engage with the public. But these, um, these events or um, I don't know, avenues of historical inquiry kind of drift out over time. And I, so I think there's a larger project in question of intergenerational um, loss and silence and a lack of, of connection happening in Newfoundland Labrador right now that informs um, the kinds of perishable and precarious archival collections that exist. So my work as an artist um, follows, you know, the work of Makiki um, in particular, who has very long genealogies uh, doing this work across um, what we call as Canada right now. Um, so they are a, a mixed Acadian and Mi'kmaq artist. Um, whose recent and past works deal with queer histories and temporalities. So I'm forever grateful to their practice um, for shaping the kinds of work that I can do. I'm also really grateful to contemporary um, visual and performance artists in St. John's like Kai Bryan, Jason Wells, and Jason Penny, um, who form the curatorial collective Retroflex, who um, organized a specific exhibition that I uh, collaborated on with artist Coco Guzman in 2019. And so this project um, was an attempt to rethink local community archives, ruptures, disruptions, um, and to question what, what of queer and trans historical knowledge um, might be meant to be missing, what can be uh, found together and what can be mapped anew. So this project um, was called A Hole So Big It Became the Sky and it was, uh, it took place at Eastern Edge Gallery in St. John's. It involved uh, working with community participants to do drawing exercises, um, historical workshops where we um, worked through a bunch of ephemera and documents and shared our own lived knowledge. And most importantly, we mapped significant um, queer spaces and places throughout the city over the past 50 years. So working with um, you know, these newsletters from older organizations to create a um, a living map of the queer past and present. The walls of the gallery became a map of their own um, with illustrations of land masses, uh, but also, um, you know, personal illustrations, diary entries, um, you know, personal worlds created on these walls. Um, it was so special to see the community come together in this way to form um, an archive of this measure and depth, even though it would ultimately disappear from the gallery walls, the walls would be painted over, it would survive somehow underneath those layers of white paint as, as these exhibitions always do. And somehow the memories would exist in this space. In the middle of the room here, we see um, speakers. I created a sound installation working with a bunch of oral histories that I had recorded between 2014 and 2019. So ultimately this exhibition um, was an assemblage 
of the contemporary moment in 2019 um, for the community to come together and question moments of the past that hadn't been shared, um, to think about how being positioned in an island or being positioned in rural Labrador um, might shape a specific connection with a larger um, queer cultural or historical public um, and to do something about that. I love this. Um, this section of the wall here, uh, we have everything from mermaids to the Chan headquarters, lots of little gay bars. We have historical sex work spots and how these things all come together. Um, specifically thinking about like the changing downtown landscapes of smaller cities as well and how queer knowledges survive. Um, as those landscapes are remade continuously. Are you still here? A pivotal question that I ask. Um, two queer and trans elders. And then these are the last, um, this is the last slide to point to Quadrangle, which is the current um, community center without an actual community center in the province. I think the reality of, of spatial relationships and having physical places to hold material um, is important. And so this has been a long-standing issue in Newfoundland and Labrador specifically. And so I'm hoping to work with Quadrangle to develop some ongoing history programming and think about some further ideas to share with the community. And otherwise, this is um, a link for the Newfoundland Gay history Instagram page which is currently run by Fabian Fitzpatrick and here's a little clip of Robin holding the sign. Um, so thank you folks for listening. I'm happy to answer any other questions about this work. Thank you and I'll send it back to Jackie. Right. Thank you very much for that presentation, Daisy. That was uh, really quite amazing. And it's uh, good to hear that uh, Quadrangle is moving forward, even uh, as it stands virtually, it's still moving forward. So that's fantastic to hear. Um, I'd like to thank each of our speakers for their um, important contributions to our webinar today, particularly in relation to how we can continue to grow our efforts across the Atlantic region to preserve and share our LGBT uh, histories. Now, before we open it up to questions, I'd like to thank our partners and our funders, specifically our Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive, which was funded through the Nova Scotia Department of Seniors, and that our Lesbian Oral History Project is funded through the Nova Scotia Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage. We're grateful for that support. Uh, thank you to Dalhousie University Archive, to the Elderberries, to NS Rapp, to the Halifax Public Libraries, uh, and our past and current team members, including Rachel Moore and Summer Hayes, Lydia Hunsberger, Dan McKay, and thank you to our community advisory committee members. Would also like to thank our production team who worked hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. Thank you to Marla McKay, James Wilson, Jolene Reed, uh, Nicole Munsell, uh, Stacey, or, sorry, Jace uh, Stinson, uh, and thank you again to our speakers. So um, I'd like to now uh, open it up to the floor and if there are questions could you please address them to a specific uh, person? That would be uh, very helpful. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions right at this point, uh, so I'm going to free range it and just ask what do you think is the most important component of ensuring that these histories are collected, preserved and shared? Just open it up to the floor on that one. Yeah, please go ahead, Rachel. Um, I think there's a number of different perspectives that you can take on this because coming from different places and having different relationships to the collections that we have, I think we all probably have a slightly different answer to this question. Um, so coming from an archival background and like a recent archival background, it, there's a, a focus on preservation and wanting to have these things be available in perpetuity so that they can be of some use to the community in that respect. 
Um, and so I think the archival perspective on that is the most important aspect is the physical preservation of these, ensuring this information continues on. Um, but as we've seen throughout these presentations, there's a lot of different ways that you can approach history and different ways that you can interact with these records. So while we are trying to protect these things as much as possible, I think that you can see from the fact that we are um, developing the duplicates collection and trying to make these things available in different ways that sometimes deriving a use from those materials and allowing those to go back into the community to serve some kind of educational purpose or to be created into another piece of art so that that piece of art can then go and exist in the community and uh, people can interact with it in that way. I think that stuff is equally important um, and there's different ways that we can go about achieving it. I don't think it's a, a these have to be preserved in perpetuity and that's the only way that we can approach archival materials. I think that you can find some kind of compromise in a middle ground somewhere and that's very much what we're trying to do with developing the duplicates collection and working with the community to think of other ways that these materials can be used. Great, thank you very much for that uh, answer, Rachel. Uh, uh, next, somebody else want to weigh in on that one? Um, if I could uh, just add a bit to that, I note that my image I think is frozen at the moment, but I'm not. So um, just to uh, pick up on what Rachel said, as I think you can tell from my presentation about the Passage Memory Project, um, uh, we're very interested in looking at um, uh, ways of engagement with materials. And while the role of the traditional archive is important in terms of preservation, um, engagement and preservation can be in conflict with each other or competing with each other. and uh, uh, having had the experience of running an art museum and knowing what the contradictions are of freezing artworks in, in vaults and keeping them preserved as opposed to having them part of people's everyday life. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in looking at how to open up a, a living dynamic space uh, for engagement with historical materials and with memory and memory, which is also the memory that people hold in their own minds and, and themselves. Great, good point, Robin. Thank you for that. Meredith, any thoughts from your perspective? I, I guess one thing that's kind of um, struck me while I've been um, listening to Daisy and, and Robin, and I'm so glad that they were able to attend and um, uh, is like kind of the, the meeting of um, the or the idea too of counter archives but also especially the use of art and we have uh, also been involved in a couple of different art projects which really helps bring the community together too and the the funny thing about QHINB is, is that we are a community archive we um but our, our our records are housed in a government institution um so we do have um input from the community we're we're run by a board we're a nonprofit organization but our records are held within GNB and they've they, honestly they've been a fantastic and very accepting partner but historically there is the um historically it may not have been um but um since we started in 2016 we've had great um support from them um with uh, housing our records here at PANB Great, thanks for that. Um, Denise or Daisy, anything else you would like to say on that point? I, I think everyone has spoken so eloquently, but I, I know that I think that history, keeping history alive is in the using of it, and I love events like this, and I would just love to see more events where we get to interact, and there's that community interaction. With, uh, with all of these archives and these materials. Great, thanks for that, Denise. Daisy, anything from your perspective? I would add that my approach to this work has been heavily informed by my position as a sex worker and a trans woman who doesn't have like, who is who doesn't have an institutional job or doesn't have funding to do this work. So it's like, the, the narrative that I always share is, you know, sitting in the reading room or sitting in the basement of the library, digging through microfilm or working with sensitive materials and getting texts from clients and like having to negotiate. And so being in and out always like with my attention with queer history. And so the demands of 
of sex worker life in particular, but I also think about um, some of the thoughts of Mira Soleil Ross when she started doing a lot of her documentary work in the early 1990s as a trans sex worker, um, as an indigenous trans woman sex worker. Um, and so she asked the questions, you know, how long am I going to be around? Um, how is my history going to be preserved? So that kind of that kind of ethic of like knowing I must do something. I didn't have any formal training in uh, historical research or working with archival material, but I learned that as I went along. Um, but I did imagine that I, you know, having access to certain materials would would change my life for the better, and in some ways it did. But I wasn't prepared to encounter the weight of queer violence in the archive. And I'm still figuring out how to work through that because the majority of my research and creation center so specifically on the lives of trans women and sex workers. And so when I look at what has been documented in the Newfoundland Labrador context, I see violence being spit back at me. So that's why the artistic route becomes so important. And to think about new futures with the community together um, is centered in my work in that way, to really rethink the violence and to question the logic of the archive. But to go back to what Rachel was saying, as well about how moments of joy or happiness aren't necessarily captured by um, you know the archival machine and so sometimes oral history is necessary sometimes ephemera are necessary or so on and so forth so i guess to say like you know doing this work isn't really easy and we can never be prepared uh, to find certain things but there is this there is this push in me to form this um, archival relation and that keeps me going Fantastic. Thank you for that, Daisy. Um, we have a, a question here. Um, this is open to the to anyone who would like to respond. Uh, how can we engage with younger folks to get them interested in learning more about our collective history and overcome what seems to be a generational divide slash gap? Who would like to weigh in on that one first? Yes, Rachel, go ahead, please. So I, what I've noticed from uh, doing the community outreach portion of the project is that there is a lot of interest from young queer people in being involved in things related to queer history. I think it's just that it's not it's not very clear where to go within the community if you have a desire to be involved in some way, especially if you're looking at it from an institutional perspective, because there's not that much that we can ask volunteers to do from an archival processing perspective because it's a specialized skill set and so that is inherently something that does prevent people from being involved in working with these materials if you don't have that kind of an educational background um, so i think as much as possible creating spaces and opportunities for young queer people to be involved in learning about their history once those opportunities arise i've noticed we're recording seniors we're not looking for a ton of young people but whenever i put a call out for people to be involved in our community advisory committee or to give feedback on the guidelines that we're developing a lot of that interest does come from youth. So I think it's just channeling that through creating opportunities like this where they can come and join in on a conversation or um, group discussions that they can sit in on, organized opportunities and designated spaces for the queer community to kind of exist in because we've lost a lot of these things as the community has become more disparate and so i think that clarity and providing those spaces and providing those opportunities and making sure that that gets out and distributed through as many channels as you can uh, i think is is one of the ways that we can kind of work towards getting young people involved in this kind of work in these conversations great thank you for that rachel and the, the funding that we received from nova scotia department of seniors was exactly as Rachel describes, it was meant to be an intergenerational learning opportunity, but I take your point that we need to find other ways to uh, mobilize on that. Um, would anybody else like to weigh in on that particular question? How do we overcome the generational divide slash gap? Please, Meredith, go ahead. Um, I, I just want to say um, that I agree exactly with what with what Rachel's saying. Um, I 
it's been it's been awesome to participate too in the uh, Canadian Center for Gender and Sexual Diversity um, conferences. They've received a lot of funding and they have gone around to different um, organizations in Atlantic Canada. Um, and usually there have been in the past couple of years, two places in New Brunswick that have been um, selected a rural area and an urban area to have um, these talks. And it's really wonderful being able to chat with high school students. I did a presentation at Ecos Saint Anne here in Fredericton a couple of years ago um, and then last year over COVID they were virtual but um, it's uh, good and it, it's a resource too that teachers can use in their classroom um, and really any teacher can use in their classroom because I know some teachers are very hesitant to bring up this material or just uh, these topics too to their to, in their classroom. Um, another project that QHIMB has been involved in is with um, uh, the UNB, uh, so University of New Brunswick Education Department. They've been, um, th there's a, a now, um, uh, it's called uh, uh, Queer History Matters, um, and it's for queering the social studies curriculum. Um, and it was developed by uh, Casey Burkholder, um, who's one of our board members. Um, and it uh, presents uh, various lesson plans for teachers to use from K to 12, um, as well as videos to that uh, GSA students have put together, but also provides examples for youth to use as well. And um, our partnership has really been to get queer history into the classroom and I think that there will be other uh, initiatives in the coming year to to do that so that's been um, really fun work that we've been involved in um, I'd love to do some more work with GSAs um, so um, hopefully that will come great thank you for that Meredith um, I see a question specifically for Robin um, so Robin the question is what spurred the creation of the memory passage project how many people did it take to get to the point that you're now at? Well, thanks for that question. Um, the Passage Memory Project grew up first and foremost out of my own kind of compulsive uh, activities of collecting everything I could lay my hands on. And um, uh, because uh, people knew that I was saving things and dating them and putting them in file folders and boxes, people would often give me things saying, oh, here's something for the archives, meaning, you know, the collection that I was building, which goes back to 1975. Um, so many, many people have contributed through donating things. Uh, more recently, though, the the Passage Memory Project is a working title for for a work in progress, which is the project that I'm under uh, the I'm in the process of developing right now with working with uh, Brody Weaver, um, who's doing the um, uh, internship and independent study, uh, working with me, and uh, uh, we're looking at the, the technicalities of this, um, things like how to uh, put together finding aids, how do we want to structure this because it's not a conventional archive. Um, uh, uh, and uh, what kind of governance structure, what kind of um, consultation do we want with community? Because uh, I want the the project to be guided moving forward by, um, you know, a, a diverse group of people um, uh, and have been working to assemble that group of people. Uh, so there's a discursive community who inform uh, the ongoing form of the archive and who at that, over time I would see myself turning responsibility more and more over to that group to decide on ultimate decisions position of materials, for example, or maintaining of the space. Um, uh, and uh, there are also, I would have to name researchers who've worked with me, uh, uh, like I mentioned Rebecca Rose and Craig Jennix, but also um, uh, the artist Lou Shepard is working on a project um, uh, derived from uh, contents of, the, of my collection. And um, Evelyn White, the journalist, has also done research in my archives. And so I'm informed by my conversations with them. Um, I would also just say on the on the question of the generation gap, I think it's really important to create opportunities for older and younger queers and trans people to get together. And that can be done through programs like mentorships, but a mentorship tends to privilege the idea that the older person has a skill to 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 uh, to, uh, part to uh, share with the younger person. And of course, the most interesting conversations are two way. So that's why I'm interested in having a space where people can make 
make supper together and sit down and talk and, and hang out. Um, I also just, uh, I was very interested in what Daisy had to say, uh, uh, and it reminds me of a wonderful presentation I saw by Cyrus Marcus Ware in Toronto at a uh, symposium on the history of the body politic, and Cyrus talked about imagining what the archive is of the kind of conversation that happens among um, uh, trans, BIPOC, sex workers on the street corner, and how do we, or do we, you know, animate or capture or preserve the memories, the histories that are that are represented by that. Thank you for that, uh, Robin. And we um, we're just about out of time, Meredith. Did you want to? No. Okay. No. Okay. So uh, we're just about out of time, and I wanted to wrap it up uh, on a high note from one of our uh, attendees. It's uh, I'll I'll read it directly. It's uh, not a quote. It's or not a question rather, uh, it's just to say thank you so much for the interesting and inspiring presentations. It was so wonderful to learn about these histories and the important work that you're all doing to preserve and celebrate them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then the last one here says it's not a question, but I would like to say uh, that you have all done an incredible job and I'm thankful for your contributions to queer projects. You have my thanks for bringing these issues to us in such an informative and personal way. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, just a final thank you, uh, sincere thank you to each of you for speaking today and for your presentations and insightful comments about preserving and sharing our histories from across the Atlantic region. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, merci.